honor to, I honor in to introduce Professor David Ern from the McMaster University. He is an applied mathematician with the primary research interest in epidemiology and evolution theory. He is uh, chair the Ontario Modeling Census Table and a member of the Ontario Census Advisory Table. Dr. Ern will talk about the modeling pandemic from the Black Death to COVID-19. And please. Thank you. So is the, is the microphone working? Yep, good. All right. Well, thank you very much for the invitation to speak here. It's a, it's a nice opportunity. I haven't been at the Fields Institute and given a talk for quite a while, probably before the pandemic, I guess. And it's nice to, to actually be here interacting with people in person. So we're in the midst of a pandemic still. But I have been thinking about pandemics for about 25 years, I guess, uh, most of my academic career, uh, thinking about especially what we can learn from pandemics of the past uh, and how that might help us uh, understand pandemics that come up in the future. And of course, all of that work has been very relevant over the last uh, two and a half years. What I want to do today is give you a bit of a taste uh, of some of the pandemics that I have studied over the last 25 years. And there will be a very strong emphasis on presenting the data from these old pandemics and giving you a sense of uh, what kinds of questions we can even try to ask, which are different than the kinds of questions that we can ask about the current pandemic for which we have uh, tremendous uh, volumes of data, not always what we want, but we have, certainly have much uh, greater access to data than we can get about epidemics of the distant past. So to begin with, the first type of epidemic or pandemic that I want to talk about is plague. So which you uh, may have heard of as bubonic plague or pneumonic plague. What, what has the history of plague been, been in humans? Well, there were Historians classify the history of plague epidemics into three uh, pandemics. The first began in the sixth century. The second began, which is probably the most familiar, uh, known as the Black Death, began in the 14th century. And then in the middle of the 19th century began the third pandemic, which we are still in the middle of. And you don't, you probably don't think about plague at all, but there are still there is still endemic plague uh, in rodents, even in the United States, and uh, there are deaths from plague, even in the United States, uh, um, often, you know, very small numbers, but, um, and occasional large epidemics, especially in uh, Madagascar, you might have heard about. So it's still something that's around, but I want to focus on plague uh, going back to these earlier times. And I talk about plague as having occurred in these three pandemics, but if the, the causative agent, the bacterium that causes plague, wasn't actually identified until the end of the 19th century uh, by Yersin, and the, the bacterium is called uh, Yersinia pestis. But you may wonder, given that we're talking about uh, epidemics that occurred in the distant past, how do we actually know that they were caused by uh, Yersinia pestis? How do we know that these three pandemics that I've just mentioned were indeed caused by the same organism. And of course, people thought they were because the, dis the historical descriptions of symptoms were similar, but that doesn't prove that they were really the same, caused by the same organism. But we do know the answer to that uh, because of some beautiful uh, um, genomic work done by a close colleague of mine, well, led by a close colleague of mine, Hendrik Poinar at McMaster University, who we affectionately call Indiana Bones. And um, by uh, extracting uh, fragments of DNA from the dental pulp of um, um, skulls that survive from the time of the Black Death in London, England, he was able to reconstruct the genome of the Black Death, he and his group, and it turns out to be indeed Yersinia pestis. Um, and if you're interested in this, the very interesting story of this, 
Um, there's a very nice episode of the nature of things that was made, um, narrated by David Suzuki, and it's a lot of fun. You can even see me for a few seconds in there talking to Hendrik about um, uh, the kinds of data that I'm going to mention. But it's a very interesting story, and we do know that it was this organism that causes modern bubonic plague that caused these historical pandemics. Um, and it's not just, so initially that, that uh, paper uh, was just about 1348, so the invasion of the Black Death into London. But in fact, Hendrik and his group have successfully um, sequenced the genomes of most of the pandemics in the, in the second pandemic, most of the epidemics that constituted the second pandemic starting from 1348 and going up to 1665, most of those they've managed to get dental pulp from skulls and, uh, and sequence the genomes. What about that first pandemic? Yes, again, they were able to get skulls and sequence the genome. And then of course the modern plague, we know for sure because that's the, um, the organism that's still circulating. Okay, well, identifying that it was really this organism, this bacterium that caused these pandemics is one thing, but that doesn't tell us anything about the structure of the epidemics that occurred, the, the, the rise and the fall and the number of deaths uh, or cases over time. So what can we do, what kinds of data can we obtain um, that allow us to investigate that? Uh, and I should say, you know, my perspective is very much about those type of data, counts of deaths and cases um, over time, uh, because that gives us, tells us about the dynamical pattern of the epidemics, and that's sort of my background in dynamical systems, bringing that to bear on these um, historical epidemics. So the data that we have, some, of, some, go, some data go back to the time of the Black Death in the middle of the 14th century, and a lot more to the time of the Great Plague of London uh, in the middle of the 17th century. So 1665, the time of the Great Plague of London, uh, we're in the Fields Institute, so of course this, it's important to mention this, that uh, it was also the time that Isaac Newton was a fellow, uh, a research fellow in Cambridge, and uh, during the plague in London, the, the Cambridge University was closed because they were worried about plague coming into Cambridge, and so Newton went to his country house uh, and tried to be productive, and while at his country house, he developed calculus, optics, and his universal law of gravitation. And I wish that I could say that I'd been that productive during the pandemic over the last two and a half years, but sadly, no. Um, but it's, uh, it's an inspiring uh, piece of history that he managed to achieve that while isolated uh, because of the Great Plague of London. Okay, but thinking in terms of the, uh, the type of careful science that, uh, that Newton's uh, legacy uh, is, what type of data would allow us to actually dissect the patterns of these plague epidemics? Well, what would we need? Well, ideally, we're going to need written records that survive in, some, in archives of some sort today, okay, um, but they really have to be sort of systematic records that were kept over the course of an epidemic so that we can actually see the whole pattern. Ideally, what we'd like is, you know, a death certificate of each individual who died. Uh, well, better yet, we'd like the full genome sequence of the pathogen associated with each individual. We're obviously never going to get that. What can we actually obtain in practice? Well, there are uh, a variety of, of types of records. Um, and for those of us who've spent a lot of time uh, thinking about historical records, the most obvious for the City of London is the weekly bills of mortality. These were, which um, date back to um, the 16th century and include the time of the Great Plague of London, uh, when London looked something like this, not like it does today. Um, so it was a very different time. What do these records look like? So they look like this. This is an example of a bill of mortality uh, from during the time of the Great Plague of London, and there were two pages in these big parchment sheets. On the left is a list of causes of death and the number of people 
whose deaths were attributed to that cause in that week. And I'll then on the right, there's more information that I'll come to later. And if we have a look, I mean, the causes that are listed here are very interesting, and you won't be able to read that. So if I blow it up, you might be able to see then that in this particular week, one person died of being frightened to death, three people died of grief. Um, there are all sorts of interesting causes. But most impressively, in this one week, in a city of, with a population of about half a million, more than 5,000 people died of plague. So this was a devastating epidemic. This wasn't the worst week, by the way. In the worst week, it was around 8,000 people who died. OK, but we have these weekly records. Um, that's great for the time of the, uh, the period of the Great Plague of London, but the earliest bills of mortality go back to 6, 1563. So they are helpful back to that time, but there aren't any before that. Um, earlier than that, we do have some uh, weekly uh, counts of all-cause mortalities that come from the parish registers. There were 130 parishes of London that kept uh, death records, but deaths started being registered in England in 1538. So that helps back to 13, 1538, but if we want to study the Black Death in, in, sorry, 1538, but if we want to study the Black Death in 1348, then we need something else. And what historians have used to try and get a, an idea of what happened during that earlier time is to look at last wills and testaments of individuals who, well, had property or something that they wanted to leave in a will. And there are, in fact, many of these that, that survive going back to the middle of the 13th century, so that's early enough. And I could tell you fun stories about how I managed to access these various wills and count them. Ask me about that if you want after the talk. In any case, we've got all these, these wills and, uh, and these other sources of, of mortality. And if we put them together, we can start to see patterns. So, this is the 14th century where we only have wills. This is a log scale. And what I'm showing in, in yellow, I've highlighted the historically known years in the 14th century where there was an epidemic of plague in London. So 1348, uh, 1361, 1375, I think. And um, I'm missing one. Um, in any case, there were four in the 14th century. And you can see that there were peaks in the numbers of wills at exactly those times, suggesting that indeed wills are a tracker of uh, patterns of plague epidemics. We'll, see, we'll look into that a little more carefully in a minute. So we also have wills later, of course, and uh, what I'm showing here is again wills and uh, in yellow known plague epidemic years. Uh, and again, there are peaks um, and interestingly, uh, the one, uh, this is just really anecdotal, but there's only one of these known plague years over this period where there's no peak in wills. Um, and that's the one uh, year of this period when Hendrick's group have not managed to sequence Yersinia pestis. Uh, so that's just a matter of interest. Of course, that, that may change going forward. Okay, but then we have these other sources of data, um, which are the parish registers and then the actual bills of mortality that list plague as a cause. Uh, and they weren't continuous, but they were always published uh, during these plague epidemics uh, during this period after 1563. So we have these various sources. What do the epidemic patterns themselves actually look like? So here from the 14th century, a couple of examples in 1348 and 1361. And you can see that indeed, over this, this period, there's a rise in the number of wills that were written, suggesting that people were writing wills because they were either knew they were uh, um, about to die or feared that they were about to die. And so it's potentially a tracker of the pattern of the epidemic. Later, this is, these are a couple of 17th century epidemics, including the Great Plague on the bottom here. And we have the three sources of data. And, uh, the, the scales are different so that they, uh, they sort of, uh, so that the maxima match up here. And you can see that they, they seem to roughly agree at indicating that there was a rise at the time of the, uh, of the epidemic in all three. Okay, well, 
kind of question that I'd like to ask is, well, okay, we've got all these plague epidemics. Can we see a difference, for example, in the patterns of the epidemics in the 14th century and the 17th century? In order to do that, um, we need to somehow compare the earlier data for which we only have wills with the later data for which we have wills and actual mortality data. So is that a reasonable thing to do? Can we analyze the wills data as if it were um, data about uh, infections? Well, here is the Great Plague of London, plotted up the weekly mortality from the bills of mortality. And I'm going to plot as well, scaled up so that they have the same maximum, the counts of wills that were written um, during that time. And I think you can see right away that uh, the growth of the epidemic uh, is very, very similar in the wills and in the uh, mortality. And so it suggests that if we compare the rates of growth of the epidemic, that in fact, the wills will be from the earlier time will be a very reasonable tracker. So that raises the question, well, what were the rates of growth and what can we infer from that? Okay, so let's try to compare the rates of growth of the epidemics from the 14th century and the 17th century. It's a good thing to look at because the growth rate of an epidemic is just a property of the, of the epidemic curve. I don't have to make any assumptions about what the transmission mode of the disease is, for example. And that's important when we study plague because the organism, Yersinia pestis, causes various forms of disease. It can cause bubonic plague, which is normally transmitted from rat or from a rodent to fleas to humans. But it can also cause pneumonic plague, which is transmitted directly human to human. And those differences will make it different to the type of mathematical model that we, were, we would want to write down. But the growth rate of the epidemic doesn't depend on that. It's just a property of the curve. And so we can make a comparison um, directly without having to worry about uh, whether that depends on assumptions about the transmission mode or other details of the epidemic process. OK, so what happens when we do that? We just need to estimate the rate of growth from these epidemics. Well, that. Uh, may seem like a simple thing to do. So um, here is the Great Plague of London again, but on a log scale. And if we want to estimate that rate of exponential growth, then we just, all we need to do is draw a straight line on this log scale, and the slope of that line will be the exponential rate of growth of the curve. Great, so that's, that's going to give us an estimate of this growth rate. However, um, this is, uh, the, 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 that, that slope is based on the, the window, the period over which it, the graph looked straight to me, and a colleague looked at the same graph and thought that this was, in fact, the, the, the region over which the slope was straight, and that's a big difference in the slope. So how do we deal with that? So it turns out that estimating an exponential growth rate from a curve like this is a somewhat tricky problem. So we spent a lot of time worrying about that. And cutting a very long story short, it turns out that if instead of simply fitting an exponential curve, you fit uh, a saturating curve such, a, such as a logistic curve, then you can do much better and much more reliably estimate exponential growth rates. So these two curves, one is a simple exponential curve, one is a logistic curve, they both have exactly the same initial exponential growth rate. But if you fit the logistic curve, to the type of data that I was just showing you, then you more reliably get the correct answer for, um, uh, for, the, uh, for the actual epidemic growth rate. And we tested that with, with vast numbers of simulations where we know the correct answer. Okay, so what happens then when we apply this methodology to uh, these plague epidemics? We find rather remarkably that the 17th century plague epidemics grew four times faster than the 14th century epidemics, which was a stunning uh, result. So just to give you a flavor, uh, rates are less intuitive than time. So the, the time it took for the number of deaths per, uh, per day or per week to double in 1348 was about 45 days, but only about 11 days in 
1665. That's an enormous difference in the rate of spread. So why did that acceleration occur? Why did plague spread faster in the 17th century than in the 14th century? We don't know the answer yet, but there are a variety of hypotheses. So it could be that the pathogen evolved uh, to be more infectious or infectious for longer. Uh, it could be that changes in the population or, or density or social structure or the contact patterns in London, which certainly changed uh, in a big way over the 300 years that we're talking about, those could have influenced uh, the rate of spread. There were also changes in weather. You may be aware that uh, the time of the 17th century was, in fact, the middle of the Little Ice Age uh, in Europe when the weather was quite a bit colder. That could have influenced um, the pattern of plague epidemics. It's also possible that in the 14th century, we were seeing for ex bubonic plague in the 17th century, we were seeing pneumonic plague epidemics. And the pneumonic plague epidemics, you might expect to spread faster because they go, they spread human to human. And it could be a combination of all these things. So uh, I don't know the answer to this yet, but these are interesting questions for us to try to explore going forward. Can we say anything further just using this difference in this very interesting difference in growth rates? Well, we can in, a, in an exploratory way. So the last thing I mentioned was whether was it bubonic or pneumonic plague that caused these various epidemics? Well, it matters uh, in terms of, the, uh, of what we would predict about the size of an epidemic. So, and we don't have a way of knowing whether it was bubonic or pneumonic plague. We do, we can try to estimate the uh, number of people who died in these various times. Suppose that we, we imagine that what we were seeing in these epidemics was pneumonic plague, and that pneumonic plague was exactly like pneumonic plague that we've seen in the modern world. So for example, there was a pneumonic plague epidemic in Madagascar, uh, I mentioned Madagascar earlier, um, within the last few years, for a variety of plague epidemics over the last 100 years at least, we can estimate the disease parameters such as the latent period, the infectious period uh, for pneumonic plague. If we assume that it was just like that uh, in these earlier epidemics, what do we infer? We can use that then to plug into an SIR type model and make an estimate of the implied uh, final size of the epidemic. And if we do that, what do we find out? Well, if the 14th century plagues were in fact pneumonic, then uh, the growth rate that we estimate implies after you input the disease um, uh, stage durations and estimate the final size, you get that about 20% of the population must have been infected. But historical records suggest that in London, more like uh, a third or a half of the population died. And so that seems to be, this is a rough uh, calculation, but that seems to be inconsistent, suggesting that uh, in fact, uh, those early plague epidemics in the, in the 14th century probably were not primarily pneumonic, at least not like modern pneumonic plague. So, okay, that's, uh, that's an inference that we're making then about the type of the transmission mode of this disease several hundred years ago. Um, it may not seem like the strongest inference. However, bear in mind that we are making this inference just based ultimately on counting wills that survived from the, the 14th century. And that I think is remarkable. The idea that we can count the wills that, that people wrote in the 14th century and with a little bit of mathematical analysis, um, we can conclude that it probably was not a pneumonic plague epidemic. It was probably bubonic plague. Well, that's interesting, I think. And hopefully over time, we'll gather other uh, we'll be able to make uh, stronger conclusions. Okay, well, um, I showed you, I've just been talking about the temporal pattern of plague in London. In fact, uh, we can visualize uh, 
what happened spatially because um, there was spatial information in the bills of mortality. Okay, and we can then potentially address questions like, you know, was there actually evidence of spatial spread? It's not clear that there would, that would be evident because it's a very small area of a few square miles. Um, and I just told you the, the growth was very fast, apparently, in London. Well, uh, will we be able to detect a spatial pattern? We also might be able to use the spatial uh, data to estimate a spatial transmission model and constrain the disease properties using that additional data. We might, maybe, we might be able to get estimates of things like latent and infectious periods. We might also be able to just use this, these epidemic patterns uh, to infer something about the connectivity of the population of London. How much mixing was there in London at the time? And that's something that a student of mine uh, explored uh, in the last few years in a PhD thesis. Um, and then we might be able to address this question of the plausibility of pneumonic versus bubonic plague, potentially with all this extra data, maybe. For now, I don't actually have the answers to any of these questions, but I'm going to show you what this, these data look like. So what we're talking about is the right hand of, the, of a bill of mortality here, the right hand page. Um, and what, what's there is the list of the 130 parishes, the number of people buried that week, the number of people who, whose death was attributed to plague. Uh, and so we have this weekly, we can plot up and make a movie of the uh, mortality. This is actually not the way most of the bills of mortality look. Most of them are handwritten um, and they look like this. They were just basically forms that were filled in by hand. And so if you blow that up, you can see here the numbers that were written on, but this is not unusual. Every bill of mortality that I've looked at, the handwriting is absolutely crystal clear. So fortunately, we were able to digitize all these numbers and produce really high quality uh, data. So what happens when we do that? So what you see here is the city of London. Um, in yellow, the, it was a walled city in 1665, so the yellow shows the wall of London, and the, the other yellow line is the Thames River. And the red are the boundaries between the parishes, um, and underneath is, a, is actually a somewhat more modern map of London, which I embedded there so I could see where I was looking, uh, since I know modern London reasonably well. Um, what I'm going to do is color the parishes in the sequence in which a plague death was first uh, recorded in the bills of mortality. And as I do that quickly, ask yourself whether you can see a pattern of spread spatially, or whether, as you might expect in this small space, it just very quickly uh, spread everywhere. Um, and remember that there's a, at least a week delay between each of the, the clicks as I go through. So the first death from plague was recorded outside the walls, in a parish off to the left there. Then it spread near to that. And uh, at this point, it's still spreading, but outside the walls of the city. And then the next week, it appears to have crossed somehow through the wall and over here. This is, the, this is London Bridge, which was the only way across the, I showed you actually a as a painting of London Bridge at the time. Um, so this, it appears to have crossed London Bridge and there's a major gate to the city in the top left there. So it seems to have been spreading through places that it could spread. Um, and as we move forward, it, over time, remember this is week by week, you can see in fact that it is encroaching slowly on the very center of the city. Okay. Um, Incidentally, um, here, uh, no deaths from plague were re plague recorded, but many deaths were recorded there because that's the Tower of London, um, where many people died of other causes. Um, so I think that visual representation makes clear that there was spatial spread during the, during the Great Plague of London. Um, and uh, and I, I think it's, it's somewhat remarkable that we can reconstruct that and that it actually is visible. It wouldn't be surprising at all 
if it had, if we wouldn't we couldn't see any spatial spread at all uh, over the course of the, the few months this took place. Okay, um, so I mentioned um, that there was this CBC Nature of Things documentary that was made about Hendrik, and they um, when they did this, they they actually filmed me for uh, what seemed like hours over and over again telling Hendrik what I just told you going through that that sequence of pictures and you know I thought that you know when the when it came out there'd be this nice movie of this uh, animation that I spent so much time making nope um, so they they weren't satisfied with my uh, my quality of uh, graphics so instead they had their team make their own animation um, so I'll just quickly show you what that looked like um, so this is the CBC's animation of exactly the same thing. And they had David Suzuki talking over this saying, oh, and, you know, there was, uh, I don't know why it's, well, the disc is slow because it's on. Oh, no, that doesn't make sense. I don't know why it's jumping so much. Anyway, it's normally smoother. Um, but they have him saying, oh, and the plague started to spread. The red means that the plague does have occurred. And they say, oh, no. And then we look at this gate of the city and it burst through, it burst through the gate of the city, and in a flash, he says, it spread throughout the, 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 the city of London. And it's all really cool and wow. Uh, and when I saw this, I thought, well, wow, that is, that's really nice graphics. But they paid no attention to the three hours or whatever they spent uh, having me uh, tell this story, because in fact, what I kept emphasizing was how stunning it was that it moved so slowly through the city. It took like months to get from that gate to the center of the city. How on earth did that happen? You know, what was, how could it have spread so slowly, really? Um, so anyway, that's um, uh, the CBC's animation. Now, I want to show you one more example of a, of a spatial animation, um, which was made by uh, my colleague Junling Ma, who wrote some software to visualize the, the epidemic, uh, uh, the spatial epidemic in a, in a different way. And what you'll see here is, um, actually, I'll just start it. So, um, okay. So, um, I don't know if you can, there is a date in the top, it says February 1665, and it's going through. And by about now, all of the spread that I've showed you before has happened. But then the first bar that you see coming up, which is proportional to the, which is a per capita deaths from plague, was in the middle of the city. And then it just, and eventually it's just raging by the time it gets really big. So all of that early spread was really very small numbers. Um, and once it became a big epidemic, it really was just mixed throughout the entire city. So, and it, interestingly, the epidemic, which we're now in December of 1665, it continues smoldering like this for a year. It took a very, very long time for this epidemic to end. Okay, so, Remember again, too, you know, I mean, I, I find it fascinating to look at these episodes. These are data from 1665. This is, to, you know, from old archives, we've reconstructed these patterns. And we have a better image of the Great Plague of London that we, than, than we do for most epidemics that have occurred in the 20th century. So because people uh, uh, kept these, uh, these records. Okay. So another disease that's prominent in the bills of mortality is cholera. And in the, in the 19th century, there were four uh, cholera pandemics. Um, incidentally, I didn't say this, but it's probably familiar to most people here that you know, pandemic really refers to a, uh, a, a, an epidemic that spreads very rapidly around the world, or at least over a large, you know, not just within a given uh, locality. So there were these three, these four uh, cholera pandemics. There were annual cholera epidemics that were relatively small in London every year. And you can see evidence of that in this time series that there are these small annual blips along the way, but they're nothing in comparison to the four major 
uh, pandemics that occurred that I've colored red here. And I'm going to color in yellow. I don't know if you can see it here, but just before the big epidemics, there's another little epidemic uh, that I've colored yellow. And I want to look a little bit more carefully at those. I've labeled them herald waves, and you'll see why in a second. So here's the 1832 pandemic. The main wave of the pandemic is this big red peak, um, but there's this yellow uh, peak that I've plotted there, which is pretty interesting because the annual cholera epidemics always occurred in the third quarter of the year, which is where, when the big uh, epidemic occurred. But that yellow epidemic is totally out of season. This is the wrong time. And that suggested to us that perhaps there was an invasion of a new variant of cholera at an out of season time that was then able to take off in a big way when conditions were better for the spread of cholera. So we see that in 1832. We see it in 1849 as well. We see it in 1854. And we don't see it in 1866. The annual cholera epidemic here occurs at exactly the normal time. OK, so what do we infer from that? Well, there were these four cholera pandemics in the, in the 19th century. Three out of four were preceded by an out of season herald wave, we're calling it. Incidentally, the term herald wave comes from studies of influenza because there was a herald wave in 1918 before the big wave in 1918. I'll come to that in a couple of minutes. Um, so as I said, we hypothesized that there was a new, a new invasion and that perhaps the reason we don't see the herald wave in 1866 was just that the new variant of cholera happened to invade at a time of year when, uh, when it was good conditions for cholera anyway. This is just a hypothesis. But uh, in the spirit of, uh, of, of something that Michael mentioned in his talk, we considered the plausibility of this hypothesis by making a simple model and seeing whether we could generate exactly this pattern of a herald wave followed by uh, a much larger wave. So we did that by constructing uh, uh, an expanded SIR model that includes a water compartment into which the pathogen spreads and from which people can be infected from the water. When we did that, um, we, we found we could, in fact, uh, generate uh, epidemic patterns that look very similar to the real data. So the, here is uh, the real data for the, in this case, the 1849 epidemic. And this is the model down here. Incidentally, it's the SIWR model, W for water, which we call this sewer model, uh, which is very uh, appropriate given uh, what was going on with cholera in London. Um, so if we insert a new strain at the right time, then indeed we do get exactly this pattern. And of course, under the hood, we were also including there was seasonal variation in transmission, which we know was the case. That's what drove the uh, cholera epidemics always occurring in the third quarter. Um, and the model also tracks uh, the pathogen concentration um, and the prevalence of the disease in humans. Okay, so that's a plausibility argument uh, about uh, what might have caused this epidemic pattern of cholera. Before 2020, the pandemic that would have been most salient for all of us uh, was the 1918 flu pandemic and other flu pandemics. Uh, I mean, everybody here would remember 2009, though it wasn't so devastating. It turned out to be not, not such a virulent pathogen. But 1918 uh, was really important, uh, I mean, really for the history of humans. And one of the things that has been so interesting for people studying the 1918 flu is that there were three waves in 1918, 1919. And I think the fact that this pattern ex exist, existed is what most, made most people think, oh, there's going to be multiple waves of COVID. I mean, there are all sorts of reasons to expect that. But I think the the fact that that's what happened in 1918 really drove people to think, oh, we're going to have all these multiple waves. It's going to be like 1918. So this was the Herald wave in 1918, a small wave that occurred in the summer. I'm showing you, this is for London, by the way, again, London, England. Uh, and then there was the big main wave in the fall, and then a subsequent wave in the spring of 1918. And before COVID, uh, colleagues and I investigated trying to understand why there would have been three waves within a calendar, within one uh, 
12 month period uh, when this new pathogen invaded. And so the way that we did that was um, we expanded an SIR type model um, and we, we kept track of uh, deaths. We included a possible decay of immunity, which is, uh, is normal for influenza. And just including that, we just get nothing interesting. We get a single epidemic wave. So we then asked, well, maybe the parameters of the model are actually changing over time. Uh, and so in particular, the transmission rate might be changing over time because of behavioral change or policy changes that occurred during the pandemic. Um, it's possible that the, that the infectious period and hence the recovery rate was changing over time because of the pathogen evolving. Um, and it's possibly possible that the that these other parameters that we introduced, the rate of decay of immunity or the or the or the severity of the disease, the which manifested as the case fatality proportion were changing over time. So we looked at all of that and and sparing you all the statistical details, we found that um, a time varying transmission rate was was provided the best fit to um, to the data and that in fact constant infectious period and constant uh, case fatality proportion uh, were uh, uh, do the best job and that permanent immunity was the best job but really we were only looking over a one-year period all we're saying there is that immunity lasted at least a year which is maybe not surprising for influenza okay so here's an example this was by the way i a, we, we consider it as a stochastic epidemic model. The box plots up here show a thousand realizations of this stochastic epidemic model with these parameters. And um, you can see that the uh, expectation from that sequence of box plots agrees very well with the actual data, which are shown in blue here. And uh, I won't belabor these points, but I mean, there's a formal statistical analysis behind this. Um, these are profile likelihoods for those of you who know what that means um, for estimating the parameters. Okay, so that's potentially interesting. Okay, so it looks like the transmission rate changed over time in order to explain the three waves in 1918. But changing transmission rate doesn't give us a sense of the mechanism that drove those changes. So what actually could have given rise to changes in the transmission rate? Well, we considered a variety of and so in a, a follow-up study, we considered a, a, a variety of possibilities. In particular, it seemed likely that uh, behavioral response to what was happening would be a factor. You know, if you know that tons of people are dying in your community, you're less likely to run out and have a party. Um, we know that from the last three years, regardless of whether you're forced to or not, you might choose to reduce your interactions with others. So we introduced a, an effect of perception of risk in proportion to the amount of mortality that was occurring. Um, so this introduced new parameters, uh, how long it took uh, between um, loss of infectiousness and when you actually died, and the mean amount of time that deaths impacted on your perception of risk. And we also included a couple of other things. We considered the effects of, of schools being closed and we considered, this is the behavioral model, um, and we considered the effects of weather. Okay, and when we put all of that into the model, we then put in, uh, used the statistical machinery and found uh, the, the model that was best in the sense of the, of the AIC, a Kiki information criterion. And it's the model that includes all of those effects. That does the best job. So, and you can see again, these are box plots of a thousand realizations of the model, of the best fit model and the data. It seems to do a good job. We then ask, well, how well could we have done if we left out each one of these three effects? Um, so if we left out the behavioral response, we did very poorly. The, the agreement is terrible and we cannot get three waves. Okay, that's, that's very significant. On the other hand, if we stick with including behavior, but we leave out schools or we leave out weather effects, 
then we don't do as well as we do when we include them. On the other hand, it's a relatively minor effect. And so we concluded that the primary thing that seemed to drive the changes in transmission rate that gave rise to those three waves was seems to be within the framework that we considered um, change human response, behavioral response to um, to perception of risk from from what people heard about or knew about from people who died or what was going on in the community. Okay, so what did we our inferences from that study? Um, changes in the transmission rate were most important, and its behavioral response um, that was critical. Okay, so, oh, Here's what actually, I found. oh dear, my, my watch thinks I'm talking to it. Um, so, briefly, I just want to mention another uh, disease, which you don't think about as a pandemic disease, uh, smallpox, but something you must have heard about, even though we don't have it circulating, and it hasn't been circulating since 1980. Um, smallpox is, was around for thousands of years, and so we don't know exactly when it initially invaded, but it would have caused a pandemic of some sort. And so we can think of it as, it, it fits the framework of talking about the history of pandemics. And the bills of mortality list smallpox, and it's an amazing set of data, which I'm showing, it's, it's hard to see the details, but there's a there's a, a very complicated pattern of recurrent epidemics of smallpox over more than three centuries. Uh, and uh, my PhD student, Olga Krilova, and I studied this very carefully, uh, and she did a beautiful job of, of also studying things that, that could have influenced the pattern of epidemics. So one is the uh, births, which are marked in red, uh, and she found historical evidence for uh, all sorts of policy changes, implementations of various things over time, wars and other things that might have impacted smallpox dynamics. And very importantly, she also found uh, historical records indicating the degree of vaccination once the vac vaccine was invented, and before that degree of what's called variolation, which was this process of intentionally infecting people by transferring smallpox virus from an infected person to an uninfected person, uh, usually into their arm. They became infected and didn't die so often, um, and then became immune without the very serious disease that was typical when they were infected in the normal way through the respiratory tract. Anyway, all of these things implicated the, the pattern of epidemics, and uh, well, I encourage you to look at this paper, which, um, which uh, describes these data very carefully, and uh, ongoing work uh, allows us to infer things about the impact of those uh, factors, birth rate, um, the contact rate, variolation and vaccination, they all influence and cause changes, in, not just in disease prevalence, which you would expect, I mean, especially vaccination, but in the patterns of the epidemics. And it's actually extremely complicated, and it's a lovely nonlinear dynamics problem, because you have um, um, a periodically forced a dynamical system that's subject to very slowly changing external uh, changes. And that, that's, that's just a fabulous uh, mathematical problem. So, uh, but that's a subject for another talk. Okay, so um, I guess I, I'm almost out of time, but we started a bit late. So it's, is it okay to go an extra few minutes? Yeah. Um, so I wanted to end by talking about the present pandemic. Uh, and just say a little bit about work that uh, that uh, that I've been involved in uh, during the pandemic. Um, so that's about SARS, but of course we're not in the first SARS. The first SARS was nearly 20 years ago uh, in 2003, and uh, well, some of you probably don't even remember it because you're too young, but uh, most of you probably have a have an inkling or have read about it. And it was pretty scary at the time. Uh, we were all really worried about it, uh, but uh, at the end of the day, it caused around 8,000 deaths, uh, sorry, around 8,000 cases and less than 1,000 deaths, which seems uh, no big deal compared to what we're, uh, we're experiencing now. However, uh, as I, before 2020, 
in talk after talk when I, when I showed these data, I pointed out that that case fatality proportion was rather a big deal. And if this hadn't been contained, the devastation it would have caused would be like unthinkable compared to what we've had in the last uh, two and a half years. I mean, I, it's, it's incredible. Um, anyway, that was SARS-1. This is SARS-2, uh, where we've had well, at least more than 600 million reported confirmed cases, more than 6 million uh, deaths attributed to, to COVID, and clearly many, many more in reality. And not just the three waves that some people predicted we would get uh, because of 1918, but uh, what's seeming to be an endless sequence of waves of the pandemic. So these are the worldwide data. Um, this is on a log scale, and I've shown the SARS-1 here for comparison. Um, uh, rather a different story. So we managed to nip it in the bud before this initial giant takeoff that presumably would have happened in 2003, but have been much, much more devastating in terms of mortality. Um, and what I've shown here as well is using the technique that I mentioned earlier, the uh, fitting exponential growth rates and their confidence intervals under them. What's actually shown is the, those are the doubling times uh, in each of these epidemic waves. So the initial wave worldwide had a doubling time of about five days, but after all the lockdowns, it slowed down enormously. Um, and it's been a very complicated pattern. And of course, as new variants have come in that are more transmissible, and yet in the, with all sorts of other factors, the amount of immunity and so on, it's a complicated story. But just, this is just a global perspective of the pandemic worldwide. In Ontario, um, uh, I, I mean, I've been involved in a lot of work um, studying the, the patterns in Ontario and trying to uh, provide input to help uh, the government make decisions. Again, uh, I'm showing just exponential growth fits here, uh, which allow us to estimate the initial doubling time in each of these initial waves. This is the first uh, a bit more than a year of the pandemic, which includes the first major variant, the alpha uh, variant, which invaded in the spring of 2021. And this is more recently, this is the Omicron epoch. So just starting from December of 2021. And the scale is completely different here. Right? So here, the scale goes up to 5,000, here up to 15,000. Moreover, um, as this took off, the whole testing system in Ontario collapsed. And so, in fact, the number of cases was vastly greater than is suggested here. Um, and the reason for those very damped out waves has more to do with testing than anything else. Okay, well, um, what, how have we approached modeling this pandemic in order to try and, uh, and of course, the kinds of things that we're trying to do are very different than then looking at the historical pandemics, what we're really trying to do is project what might happen in the coming weeks to help people make uh, important healthcare decisions. How do we do that? Well, we benefit from the fact there are lots of, there's vastly more uh, detailed data than could be made available for ancient epidemics. Um, you know, basically everything you want to know, I mean, we can argue for a long time about whether we're really provided with all the data we should be provided with, but we certainly have a great deal more data than, um, than we can get for the time of the Black Death. Um, and we have good information about when policy changes were enacted and so on, but it's a harder problem to forecast the future than to try to fit a model to, these, to something that's occurred in the past and make an inference. So we have to be careful. What we did, uh, and continue to do is we built um, uh, and, and it much a greatly expanded SIR type compartmental model um, and you know to keep track of uh, the disease pro, uh, the natural history of disease as well as you know deaths and hospitalizations and uh, and divided into ICU and age and all sorts of things and we simultaneously fit this model uh, to all the types of data that we use. Um, and uh, then we try to predict what the future is going to be based on various scenarios of, of what control measures might be adopted. 
Okay, and this is a very tricky process, and it gets harder and harder over time because um, the playing field gets more and more complicated with, as there are more and more new variants. Um, there are lots of uncertainties, and quantifying those uncertainties is difficult, uh, but we do our best. Okay, so we have to be aware that there are uh, lots of caveats with anything that we do in this. But I want to show you an example, uh, in spite of caveats, of where we, we were able to do very well. And it was at the time of the, this is data for Ontario, uh, in, at the beginning of well, late 2020, early 2021, just as the alpha wave was invading. And what I'm showing you here, the, the dots are, so we were trying to make a forecast on this date. That's the date where we, we had the data that are the black dots. This is the, what, that's reported cases of COVID-19. And we considered various possibilities. We, we fit, and also we were trying to answer the question uh, from the government of, you know, is it okay for them to uh, op open up on a particular day? So we were in a kind of lockdown and they wanted to stop that and open up. And we were charged with trying to figure out whether that was a good idea or not. And this gray curve shows what our model projected if we ignored the fact that we knew that in fact that the alpha variant was invading. If we just attributed the pattern of, of the dots basically to the original uh, ancestral virus. And then if you opened up uh, around here, then you would see this rise in the gray. But in fact, we knew that, that the alpha, alpha was invading, and fortunately for us, it had invaded quite a bit earlier in the UK, so we had good data on the speed of invasion of alpha, and we were able to model that. And when we put that into the model, instead we projected this, this rapid rise very quickly after the opening up. And we were mocked uh, in the media for this rocket ship prediction. Um, but uh, unfortunately, we knew that this was a reasonable representation. And at the time, unlike later on, we really had good data on the, on the, uh, on the rate of spread at the right time. For subsequent variants, it's tended to come too late to make good projections. And it's also been more complicated to try to understand the immunity in the population because there was, there was essentially no vaccination yet at this point. Okay, so what actually happened? Well, um, the, that's the date on which we assumed that reopening would occur because that's what the government wanted to do. We presented this projection and they opened anyway on that date. And then what happened? Well, the open dots tell you what actually happened, which is it, we did get a rocket ship takeoff. Then a few weeks later, we, we ran another forecast. Now, of course, with more even more data, and so we were able to project even more precisely um, and the, when the data flowed in afterwards, we were bang on. Okay. I, this is the best example of our, of our projections, I, I emphasize that, but it was still, it was, and, and sadly, it's an example of projections that were ignored uh, until it was too late to avoid this. Um, Eventually, they did have a new stay-at-home order, but which did have an impact. It turned it turned the epidemic over, but uh, it could have happened earlier. Okay, um, so during the Omicron invasion, which which is more recent, we we've got a much harder problem because we no longer have good testing data uh, because eligibility had to change because the capacity isn't there to test the number of people who were getting sick. Um, and consequently, we stopped calibrating our, our model. Calibrating just means you know, fitting to the part, to the data that we know so far, um, to estimate parameters. We stopped using the testing data in December and instead have been relying on hospital occupancy data. But that's not great. You don't want to be fitting these models to hospital occupancy because that's a very lagged indicator of what's going on. But it's the best that we could do. Uh, we are working on including wastewater in the testing, uh, and sorry, in instead of testing data. And I, I, I think that's very promising. And in the future, I think we may be able to do very well with that. We'll see. Um, we have 
major additional challenges because the structure of immunity in the population is not well known because uh, how your immunity depends on how many and vaccines you've had and when you had them and how many infections you've had. And it's a very messy situation now. And the level of immunity in the population is very relevant to how, uh, how quickly things will take off. So I think going forward, we're, we're going to be restricted to basically doing scenario analysis that's, that's kind of what if with much less confidence than what we were able to do with that example that I showed you with the alpha wave. So just to emphasize that wastewater uh, is a great way to go in terms of, of making um, projections, these are the Omicron data again. Um, that's the, the reported cases. And during this initial period, our estimate of the, of the initial doubling time was 3.8 days. That's the Omicron invasion was actually very fast. During this period, initially, the case data was still okay. And so our estimate of the doubling time is probably okay. Later on, it's not so clear um, what to make of these waves when the eligibility was totally different and you know, was the, the, it was strongly biased towards people who were very sick in hospital. Um, this is the wastewater data for Ontario over the same period. And what I wanna emphasize is that the, that the doubling time that we estimate from the wastewater, so this is including, this is just looking at the growth in wastewater uh, and comparing it to the cases, it's the same, okay? It's very consistent. Later on, the wastewater doubling times are much shorter than what we get from the, day, the case data. So there's a big difference when we use wastewater than if we use the highly problematic case data. Okay, um, so, I mean, I've talked about data for about, I guess, 45 or 50 minutes. Um, and I wanted to mention, so th this is, a, this is a, a meeting that's been organized by uh, MFPH, which is one of the uh, in, uh, emerging infectious disease modeling networks. And uh, uh, I'm one of the co-leads of one of the other networks, CANMOD, and one of the things that we've been working really hard on is to try and make the historical data for Canada, not London or, or other places, but the historical data for Canada publicly available. It is not publicly available and it has been buried in archives that nobody can access. And uh, we have done a lot of work over the last, uh, well, during the pandemic, trying to digitize, acquire and digitize. Actually, a lot of the data I have acquired over the last 20 years, but didn't have the resources to have it digitized. Um, but so, for example, we, there are some, there's some data where, you know, there's lists of diseases weekly with counts in tables like this. Uh, much of it is, is actually handwritten. So there are lots of handwritten spreadsheets that I've obtained from various sources, especially Statistics Canada. Um, and what our approach is, is that we scan these documents and then we make identical uh, spreadsheets, digital spreadsheets, um, that follow exactly the pattern of the original. And then we write scripts that convert those, uh, which are the, we do it that way because it's very easy to check against the original. And then we have scripts that read those spreadsheets and create data in a very convenient format. Um, and then we're writing, uh, and we, there's all sorts of issues with these data because they're not always collected in the same way and whatever. It's lots of code to harmonize them and make nice convenient data. But I hope, well, in the coming months, I hope we're gonna uh, post this and it will be a valuable website for anybody uh, initially to study infectious disease, any notifiable infectious disease in Canada going back to 1924. Ironically, I should say, that we have the data from 1924 to 2000. Since 2000, all the data were digitized, but we can't access them. And that is a long story that I could moan about for a very long time, but eventually I'm sure we will get uh, those as well. But there's a great historical record to look at. Okay, so um, just, I talked about a bunch of pandemics. 
Yeah. Oh, because somebody's coming at five o'clock. Yeah. Right. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, I was going to, to mention monkeypox, which I'll skip. I, there are a bunch of people who are involved in this work um, uh, and funders. Thank you. Thank you for your attention. And I'll be delighted to chat with you <laughs> afterwards. <laughs>